So before we even jump into our foray of the A in artificial intelligence, obviously you can see from the slides, I do want to jump into a little bit of the concept and history of intelligence. Again, we're trying to learn about artificial intelligence, creating intelligence. And so, well, guess what? You know, it might be a good idea to understand what intelligence is. So at least to start off, what is intelligence? You're all on YouTube watching this, so do the thing and leave a comment down below and subscribe, you know, like, the, whatever. Be reasonable here. Again, when we're thinking about intelligence, we're not saying, I'm not looking at, you know, Joe Schmo across the street and saying, you're not intelligent. We're trying to quantify what intelligence means. What does it mean that, uh, you know, we consider humans more intelligent than dogs, or if you're a dog person and you disagree with my statement, uh, I'm more intelligent than this back scratcher. Why? Right? That's what we're trying to do when we ask this question. And so uh, to at least take an, a, an attempt at defining an intelligence, I'm going to take a quote from uh, the mainstream science on intelligence from 1994. Uh, they said that intelligence was the ability to reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, comprehend complex ideas, learn quickly, and learn from experience. Okay, well, if I look at this and I, I you know, I, I'm breezing it right now as I think about it, uh, you know, I had to plan all the lighting uh, to make me look this good. Uh, I'm solving problems, you know, configuring where the lighting sources are. Uh, I got to think abstractly when I'm designing your assignments. Uh, you know, AI is a pretty complex idea and I hopefully can comprehend it. Uh, learning quickly, uh, hopefully, you know, I, I, I wonder what quickly means in this sort, uh, and learning from experience. And, you know, again, if we think about my last video, I was a huge proponent of the idea of practice. Okay, so, you know, if I look at this quote, all right, I can agree with it. But, interestingly enough, when, you know, they handed this definition to cognitive psychologists, you know, the professionals who actually, uh, you know, quantify and define what intelligence is, less than half of the researchers that were asked to kind of, uh, you know, evaluate this agreed. They, they actually said, no, there's still something quite, you know, there's still something quite different between me and my back scratcher uh, that you didn't quite define quite yet. I don't know. Okay, well, that doesn't mean that uh, intelligence is gone and uh, forever, you know, obviously, uh, we've found different values uh, to measure intelligence. And in fact, that's where we get into the first value or the first metric of measuring intelligence coming from Charles Spearman, trying to look at something known as general intelligence. And that's actually what created something known as the, or the, the G, just to make that a lower case, the G factor. The entire idea is, well, you can take all of intelligence and boil it down to a single variable that all intelligent beings have. And this is a number, and the higher that number, the more intelligent someone is. All right, well, you know, you can kind of think about that and go, I disagree with that oh, a lot. You know, a lot of people do, you know, one single uh, variable to rule them all. And no. And in fact, that's actually what L.L. Thurston uh, sort of did. He said, no, it can't be just a single variable. We have multiple types of intelligence, and you don't have to be good at one thing to be good at another. Uh, and so that's actually where sort of the, the Thurston's kind of uh, tests came from of, you know, measuring things like spatial ability, word fluency, memory, inductive reasoning, et cetera, et cetera, uh, across all of these different categories. But here's actually one of the interesting things, because... You know, all right, well, you defined it and we built tests around it. Go replicate those tests. And that's actually sort of an interesting point because when we've replicated those, we, the royal we of academia, when we've replicated those tests, guess what? They all still have a positive correlation supporting the idea of a G factor. They all still go back that, yeah, you know, if you're good at, if you score high here, you're also going to sky here, score high here. There is positive correlations. So is there a single variable? 
I don't know. I'm a computer scientist, not a cognitive psychology, you know, world-renowned professor. Go become a doctorate in cognitive psychology and figure this out for me so I can stop making these slides. Okay, all right, moving forward. Because again, all right, the G factor, you, you may not have known about that one, but you are very well known, hopefully, of what is known as the IQ tests. So a little bit of a history lesson for a moment. Let's go back in time. I believe it was 19, uh, I don't remember uh, off the top of my head, but uh, Al Alfred Binet and Theodore Simon uh, were building out this metric or known as the IQ, intelligent quotient. And the reason was because France had mandated that all children need to go to school. That used to not be the case. You know, again, think just back in time. You didn't have to go to school. And so, again, you've got multiple children of multiple age ranges, uh, obviously with different kind of uh, maturity levels, uh, but more specifically because they didn't all come from, you know, a, a single uh, educational source, might have different levels of education. Someone may be 10 years old but hadn't learned to read yet, or someone may be six and can already quote Shakespeare? Yeah. My entire point is the entire focus and reason we have IQ is because we were attempting to identify children based on their educational needs. Someone who was older needed to play catch up because they're not like the other 10 year olds, etc. And so one of the ways they did this is by defining out something known as the mental age. Let's say, for example, that someone is eight years old. All right, well, we give the, the eight-year-old a bunch of tests and we then look at their scores. Well, we're actually seeing that they are performing very much like an average 10-year-old. So they're actually performing higher than their current age demographic. And so what the mental age is saying is, oh, well, based on that, we're going to say that your mental age is nine. You're, you're performing better uh, than your actual, what we call chronological age. But that's actually where we've sort of expanded on that idea. And this is now where we get to the really the, the true idea to the IQ score. And the entire idea of uh, William Stern and Lewis uh, Terman, what they did is they took sort of that test and that idea of mental age and they turned it into a ratio. And that ratio is what we do is we take that mental age. So say, for example, uh, the mental age of someone who is eight and their chronological age, let's say they're eight. Again, well, eight divided by eight, that's a one times it by 100. Congratulations, you have an IQ of 100. But if you had a mental age of nine, oh, well, you know, that I'm, I'm not going to do the math. I'm going to, uh, hopefully my slides did it uh, for me. Uh, but the entire idea here is, oh, well, you're very clearly higher than 100. And so again, oh, thank you. Uh, if we again looked at that, if we had a mental age of nine and a chronological age of eight, that's going to put you at roughly speaking one point uh, twelve one two five times that by a hundred. Times that by a hundred. And congratulations, your IQ is one hundred twelve point five. That's it. There you go. That is what IQ is meant to be. Nothing, you know, if you have like an IQ of 150, okay, that just means you're performing at a higher mental age than your chronological age. But that actually introduces a, a, a harsh reality to the idea of IQ. Because as we get older, right, as we get older, IQ becomes less reliable. You're all college students or, you know, the ones of you who are in uh, uh, NC State. What is the difference between a 20-year-old and a 22-year-old? I mean, is there a difference? You know, does that mean if you are you, you behave, you're a little immature, you know, you're, you're 22, but you act like a 20-year-old, you know, you have a less than 100 IQ? Right. Or vice versa. If you know, what does it mean to be a mature 20 year old? 
Same kind of concepts are going on there. And this gets worse. You know, again, I'm the super old. So let's say I'm 35, but I'm a child at heart. So I behave. I'm sorry. I'm 35, 35, but I'm a child at heart and I act like a 25 year old. Oh, well, I'm dumb, right? There's there's my very low IQ score, so clearly I'm not intelligent all of a sudden. And so again, this is where we do run into some major issues of what intelligence was used for and then what we as humans have taken it to do. And in fact, that actually leads into some of the controversial, you know, uh, ugly parts of human society. Uh, because we think about IQ or the metrics of IQ and suddenly it shifts and suddenly it's your worth. And that's actually, you know, not really good. And in fact, uh, you know, that's where some of the, uh, I don't know, the people who are interested or supportive of eugenics come into play because again, oh, well, you know, there are certain races that are more intelligent. They score higher. So breed only them breed. Oh my goodness. Uh, more interesting, you know, if we, again, start to dig into the ugly parts of the IQ is, uh, intelligence is, again, uh, Henry Goddard uh, in New York uh, actually forced segregation and sterilization to 15,000 uh, children because, again, they were not, intelli not intelligent. They scored low on these uh, tests. Uh, Robert Yerkes, Yerkes, uh, I hope I'm saying that right. That was actually a, 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 a metric for deciding who goes to the front lines uh, in battle because if they're dumber, they're more expendable, right? And, and then there's the entire uh, concept of literally German doctors, the final solution, and what ultimately led to World War II, uh, where, again, they uh, a one major decision was made based on a, a, a newly born uh, child's sort of intelligence, not, I don't think they were newly born, but uh, based on a child's intelligence and disabilities, uh, you know, again, the German government decided whether or not it was okay to euthanize someone. And as a result, that turned once again back to this idea of using IQ for worth. And suddenly, hey, we can uh, use IQ to euthanize a lot of people. Uh, but again, it's not that I'm trying to dismay any of you from, you know, looking into intelligence and trying to study intelligence, but it is kind of important to understand where our history comes from. Because again, when we start to think about things like ethics in artificial intelligence, it's kind of important to know how we messed up in the past or how it's been done in the past uh, so that we don't sort of replicate those problems in the future.